Good morning. Really? Good morning. You have to say it loud enough that everybody out in the foyer hears it, so they'll come in and sit down and, and join us for worship. Uh, this is the nice thing about announcement time, though, is that it gives people a chance to do that and come on in. Hi, Fran. How are you? Good. Uh, so I want to let folks know about some things that are coming up. Uh, this Wednesday is our annual Christmas family party. Um, uh, so Wednesday evening, it is potluck. So bring something for yourselves that, uh, that you'd like to share with folks. Oh, thank you. I forgot that completely. Um, so that's coming up this Wednesday. Um, what time is the... It's six. Six o'clock. It's six, o'clock yeah. six o'clock on Wednesday for the Christmas party uh, down in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, we also want to remind you that on the 10th, this coming uh, Sunday, not this Sunday, a week from today, uh, the Musettes will be sharing with us in worship, so they'll be here to uh, offer a couple of songs that are from their program, which apparently was extremely well attended uh, on Saturday, at least. Um, it was packed, apparently. There were chairs around the outside. There were people in the front row, from what I hear. So that'll tell you right there. So, uh, but we are grateful to be able to worship with them uh, on the 10th. They're going to come and share with us in some Christmas songs. I um, want to let you know, too, about the Giving Tree, the family that we are sponsoring. There's, a, again, a list with some details on it that's posted on the bulletin board. You can look at that, but then ignore it, because what you need to do is take one of the gift tags off of the tree that's out here. I uh, want to remind folks that if you are buying something for one of the kids, don't wrap it so that the parents can kind of understand what they're going to... That would be a little bit shocking <laughs> for parents. Oh, my word, why did they get that? So we want the parents to be involved in this. Uh, Love, Inc. wants the parents to be involved in it. So if you buy something for the kids, just bring it in unwrapped. You're welcome, if you would like, to wrap the things for the adults uh, and so forth. But the giving tree is right out here by the office, and you can grab a tag off of that, and we'd, we'd love to have you support this family during the holiday season. Um, I think that's the announcements. What is it? had a 60th wedding anniversary, Jerry and Janice, 60 oh. years last weekend, well attended by family, so congratulations. So, you tried to avoid getting called out for it, didn't you? <laughs> well, happy, happy belated anniversary to you. Those are good things to celebrate. Um, this is the Advent season. I hope your hearts are ready. Matt, would you begin our service? Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here. We, we've made it to December. We had our snow. It's already gone. <laughs> we'll see if we get some more, but uh, it's definitely, it is definitely the season, and it is a season of, of hope and anticipation. I hope that you feel that anticipation as we move toward that time of observing the greatest gift that has ever been given. Jesus Christ. So with that, I'm going to read our scripture. It is Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause the righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this, this season, this season of Advent. Lord, we just thank you for the wonderful, wonderful gift that you have given. We thank you for the, the time to get together, enjoy each other's company. We just pray that you bless this service today. Amen. Looks like we've got our uh, responsive reading here and the lighting of the candle, so I will start that. <clears throat> our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. 
and our, our heart is glad in him because we trust in him, his, in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Psalm 33, 20 through 22. Join me in this responsive reading. Something is, something's coming. Here, eager. It's more than presence. It's more than lights. We open the book of hope and read the promise. God will be with us. Our hearts are glad. We trust God's holy name. God's never ending love surrounds us. Today we light the candle of hope. Our hope is in the Lord. Good morning. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> if you would all stand with me and join in, O oh, come all ye faithful. time of offering I, I hope that we remember that this is a season of giving so this is another opportunity for us to once again give and give in in the certainly not at the level that God gave when he gave his son but we can still participate in our own form of giving back
join me in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for these gifts that were given today. We thank you for the gift that you have given. Lord, we just pray a blessing on these gifts that we have received today, that they may bless others. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Invite the kids to come forward. I would love it if Octopus joined us. Whoa. I was going to ask if you all knew what this was. What is that? It's a box. But it's a present too, isn't it? But you can't open it. Yeah, I know. So I want to talk to you. You guys know what this season is, right? What's going on this time of year? What's going on this time of year? It's winter. December 25th and February. December 25th. What's on December 25th? Christmas. 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 Oh, Christmas. yeah. So I get to open the present. Today is not December 25th. Sorry, man. <laughs> I know. You're getting like, oh, I don't. You want to know what's in there, don't you? Oh, my goodness. What, what do you, what? Candy. <laughs> Mmm, is it candy? No. Well, we don't know. So, in the church, we, use a, we call this season the Advent season. Does anybody know what Advent means? No. It's kind of an odd word. We don't use it anywhere, really, except church. But Advent means something showing up. The Advent of uh, you guys at school when you get to school. I love that. That's wonderful. So Advent means something showing up. And what specifically are we talking about when we talk about something showing up in this season? Who are we talking about? Yes. The Holy Spirit. Good. One more. Uh, Jesus. Yes, because Jesus was born this season. We don't know exactly what time of year he was born, but this is when we celebrate it. And we are anticipating Jesus showing up. That's why we use that language of Advent. The first Sunday of Advent is the Hope Sunday. We are hoping for something to happen. That's what this present represents. Because you're hoping something is, that's, that there's something cool in there, right? If you get a present under the tree, do you know what it is? No. Do you hope that you'll be able to find out? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can shake the box, and then you can break it, and then you're like, uh, I didn't touch that. And you put it back, no, don't do that. Don't break your gifts. So this present, because we don't exactly know what it is, but we know that it's going to be something good, that's like people a long time ago were anticipating Jesus. We don't know exactly how Jesus is going to show up, but when he does, it's going to be awesome. That's what the prophets were talking about, and that's what we look forward to. But we know that Jesus showed up, but he's coming back and we don't know exactly what that's going to be like, but we know this. It's going to be awesome. I know what's in it. Just like, you don't know what's in it. Hi there. <laughs> There's nothing in it? Oh, you dropped it. Well, it's not breakable, fortunately. All right, so we're not going to tell you what's in it. All right, you guys can, let's pray and you guys can go. Oh, you really want that present, don't you? Okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this season that reminds us of when Jesus came the first time, but also helps remind us that Jesus is coming back and that we can anticipate that. We don't know exactly how, we don't know exactly when, but we know it's going to be awesome. And so we pray that this present reminds us of the greatest gift that you could possibly give us that we could possibly receive, your love. Be with these kids as they practice their play. Help it to go well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks, everybody. Present time! <laughs>
this gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of the hands. No Sorry, Estella. Get them all riled up and then you're going to have to deal with it. <laughs> That's normal, right? That's just, yeah. Uh, I want to invite you to listen to these words from the prophet Isaiah for our reading this morning. From the ninth chapter, the prophet writes, But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor you have broken, as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and his name he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David in his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the Sunday we celebrate hope in the Advent season. And hope, hope is a complicated one. It's pretty complex as far as virtues go. If the scriptures are any indication, we read uh, it's, it, that it's highly valuable. It's mentioned often, frequently. If you took all the mentions of hope and you averaged them out over the scriptures, you'd probably come across one about every seven pages in the Bible. But not everybody values hope that much. Not everybody sees it for what it could be. The, the psychiatrist David Viscount says that hope has destroyed more lives than any other emotion. He thinks it's a reflection of powerlessness. Friedrich Nietzsche once told, said that hope was, quote, the worst evil for it prolongs the torment of men. Well, hope may be a little hard for us to get a handle on if these widely divergent opinions of it are any indication. Not only does hope stir up a lot of a variety of emotional responses, it's used quite broadly as well in a variety of different ways. We talk about hope like we hope to get our Christmas shopping done, 
or we, we hope to get the checkbook to balance after we've done our Christmas shopping, or we, we hope our team wins the playoffs, or I hope I can get across the street, those kinds of hopes. It's strange that we would talk about such mundane things with the same word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 13, where he says that hope remains as one of those eternally abiding virtues along with faith and love. Everything else may perish, everything else may fall away, but hope endures. So it is both one of these three eternally abiding virtues and it's a sentiment that expresses casually the most trivial of desires. Hope, it's complex. In his book, Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes defined hope this way. Hope is appetite with an opinion of obtaining. <laughs> I think that's kind of a clever way of thinking about it. There is the flip side of that, of course. He noted that despair was the same appetite without the opinion of obtaining. Hobbes had a way with these uh, interesting, concise little definitions. This one about hope, I think, is pretty good. It covers all of the aspects that you need for it to be hope. It contains a desire, an appetite, something that you want, something that you hope will happen, a, a, a hunger. Uh, and it combines that with the expectation that what we desire will someday come to pass, we hope. That we believe that there's a good chance that it will happen. Interestingly, despair, it's still wrapped up in desire. It's still wrapped up in that thing that we hunger for, that, that appetite. But there's not the expectation that it will ever be met. This will not come to pass. That is definition of despair. And so if we take Hobbes' definition, hope works as both an eternal virtue and as that low-grade desire for those simple or trivial things. Now what gives hope power is the way that it can be applied in so many different ways to the mundane things in our lives and also is not limited to those mundane things. Hope can be brought to bear on some very significant desires, important things, things that we want or that we hunger for that impact us in the very deepest way imaginable. Hope gives life to our dreams. It lifts us out of our selfishness it provides us with a direction. And contrary to what David Viscott seems to think, the very act of hoping sustains us through some very deeply troubling times. As is the theme of the first Sunday of Advent, the, the hope that we are considering today is a rather specific hope. It's born of a particular time and, and circumstance. It is the hope of God's redemption, that God would set things right. And it has its, its roots all the way back in the history of the people of God, way back before they even knew what to hope for. The hope of God's redemption, the hope that one day God would take all of this brokenness, everything that was, that was wrecked and ruined, everything we destroyed, the hope that God would restore it, that is a hope that is incarnate in the Messiah, that is made flesh in the Messiah. It's a hope that was born centuries before the birth of Christ. And I'll tell you, it's a powerful hope, this appetite for redemption that we believe is possible because it is hope in nothing less than the complete fulfillment of everything that God wants. There's nothing bigger than that. So to hope for redemption, it assumes that there's something that needs to be redeemed, that there's something that is broken. I don't know if you've noticed recently, but the world's not great. There are things that are less than perfect out there in the world around us. There's damage, and there has to be damage. There has to be brokenness in, for, in order for us to desire any kind of a restoration. If we're wandering around under the delusion that we're, there's nothing wrong with us, then, well, why worry about what God is doing? Well, I don't think most of us have that, that frame of mind. And the roots of this damage, the roots of this brokenness stretch all the way back to the creation, all the way back to the garden. But they really start to come into sharp focus for us 
about the time that surrounds the exile of the children of Israel. You see, in a way, the children of Israel, they're there for us as, a, as something of, a, of an illustration, an object lesson, if you will. Uh, they serve as an enacted metaphor for the way that we personally try and fail to be the people that we should be. See, God gave them everything that they needed to be his people with the law and the land and all the promises and the covenants to say nothing of the protection and the providence that he provided. But they took that relationship and they took those gifts and they abused it and they squandered it and they turned away from God. Kind of like us. The exile story, it's, it's the natural culmination of this. It is the natural outworking of this decision that they made along the way to reject God. It's the reasonable consequence to their bad choices. Just like in our lives. Just like our own exile from God is our consequence. So the children of Israel, they knew what they needed to do, but they refused to do what God had told them. In spite of all the reminders that they had. They had the, 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 the priests were there to remind them on a regular basis. The prophets were there to remind them when they got too far into the weeds. And it was the prophets who we're looking at today. We're looking at Isaiah specifically. The prophets had consistently called the children of Israel to turn around, to turn from their selfish ways. They had consistently warned them that there was a price to pay for disobeying God. And just as consistently, the prophets were ignored. They were marginalized. They were persecuted. They were thrown out. They were even killed. The children of Israel wanted to follow their own desires. We don't need to go into all the gory details. There's a whole half of the Bible that talks about this stuff. You're welcome to read it at your leisure. But suffice it to say that there was a consequence. There was a punishment that was coming and it was deserved. Now when you look at Isaiah's story in particular, the story of his calling is it's recorded in Isaiah 6. And in that story, if you want to turn to it, you're welcome. But in Isaiah 6, the prophet sees this vision. He enters into the temple and he sees a vision of the Lord. The Lord is high and lifted up. The hem of his robe fills the temple. That's how grand and glorious this is. And Isaiah is so shaken by this, he fears for his life. He knows that he should not be in the presence of the Most High. He's afraid. He says, that I, am a, I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. How can I be here? And the doorposts are shaking and there's smoke and there's all this, there's angel seraphs that are flying around the room. So it's quite a scene that we have here. And the Lord wants him to say something, but he knows that he can't. And so the Lord sends a seraph, one of the angels, to take a coal out of the altar, a burning coal and he takes it with songs and he touches Isaiah's lips to purify them, to sanctify them so that he can give this message. And the message that God wants Isaiah to share with the people of God is one of impending destruction. It starts with the desolation. And then Isaiah wonders. He says, I, I, then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is utterly desolate until the Lord sends everyone far away and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part remains, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains standing after it is felled. That's the degree of destruction that we're talking about. And it's not a metaphor. <laughs> it is real. This is actual destruction that comes upon the people of God. Remember, Isaiah is speaking to them at a particular time, in a particular place. Now, the children of Israel, they're not a single nation at this point. They've already split into two kingdoms, the northern ten tribes and the southern kingdom of Judah. And not only are they not unified at this time, they're actually fighting each other. They're at war with each other. You see, 
for a long time in this region, Egypt was the big powerhouse. They'd been the, 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 in control of the Mediterranean basin, but Egypt kind of slips off the scene about now. And, and the top spot, the top spot is taken by Assyria, this new empire that's growing in the north, and Assyria starts to flex its muscles. Now, these little nations, Syria and the northern, the northern kingdom of Israel, they, they don't like the advance of Assyria, and so they try to ward this off by forming an alliance. But they don't think they can do it on their own, and so they're going to try to get Judah to join them. And so they go down to Judah, and they say, hey, we need, to, we need to fight this off, but Judah doesn't really want to join them. King Ahaz, who was ruling the, the Judah at the time, He's less than enthusiastic about the idea. He, he just doesn't think that going up against Assyria is a great plan. And so Assyria and Israel, they say, okay, if you're not going to be with us, we're going to be against you. And they say, we're going to come in and kill you, Ahaz, and put somebody that's a little more favorable to our cause on the throne so that then we'll, we'll join together. Politics. Yeah. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> We've seen this kind of thing happen in the past. Maybe not so distant. Anyway, Ahaz is afraid, that, that uh, so afraid of Assyria, he doesn't want to join the alliance, but in order for him to protect himself from Syria and Israel, in order for him to protect himself, they're attacking him now, he calls on Assyria for help. This is nuts, people. This is crazy, but this is what he does. He lets the fox into the hen house because the chickens are fighting. All right? This does not make sense in the big scheme of things, and it doesn't work out well. What happens is that Assyria, after being invited by King Ahaz, uses Judah as a springboard to conquer Syria and Israel, and then turns Judah into a puppet state. He has no more power, no more control. Assyria ends up with all of the marbles, without really having to fight. All of the nightmares, all of the worst case scenarios, all of the worst things imaginable happen to Israel and Judah. They've all come true. This is what Isaiah is talking about. He would warned them. He warned the kings of both Judah and Israel that Assyria is on the threshold. They're right there. They are coming. And God is using them to get you straight. God has prepared them like a flood to overwhelm the people. In chapter 8, verse 7 and 8, it says this, Therefore, the Lord is bringing up against it, this is Israel and Judah, the Lord is bringing up against it a mighty flood waters of the river, the king of Assyria and all of his glory. It will rise above the channels and overflow all its banks. It will sweep on into Judah as a flood and pouring over it, it will reach up to the neck. Its outspread wings will fill the breadth of the land. How's that for imagery? And that's what happens. Isaiah's prophecies here, particularly the first 12 chapters of Isaiah's book, they illustrate this very specific situation. And the, the prophet's message comes in three phases. First, Isaiah points out that there's a problem. I mean, we need to know this, right? <laughs> we need to know that something's wrong in order, for us to make a, in order for us to make a correction. So he points out that there's a problem, that the children of Israel are living as if they are not bound by God's commands. Again, sound familiar to you? As in the days of the judges, everybody is doing what seems right in their own eyes. The second part of the message, Isaiah reminds them that the, the people that God will not sit by forever. God will not pretend like it doesn't matter what you do. It's not an option for God to passively allow his people to do whatever they like. It makes me scared. Perhaps you as well. It is not an option for God to allow his people to do whatever they want. God keeps his promises. So that's where we are in the Isaiah text, in the story. 
the people. They've refused to follow their God, and God has responded appropriately. The prophet told them this would happen. Again and again and again, they were told, this is what will happen, and now it has. For the children of Israel, it was the Assyrians. We may find that we have our own enemies that are ready to overcome us, to flood over us up to the neck. Thank goodness that we're about to get to the third part of the message. Because the third part is about hope. Chapter 9, where we got our text for today, it is filled with hope. It is stuffed full of hope. Where there was once gloom, there will be glory. Where there was once darkness, there will be light. It's a promise that even in the depths of despair, there is a beacon, there is a spark, there is a light, there is an anticipation of a better day. Hear these words again. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nations. You have increased their joy. They rejoice before you as with the joy of the harvest. Gary, you know what a harvest joy is like, isn't it? It's great to bring that crop in. Oh, the joy of the harvest as people exult in the dividing of plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken it as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors, all these people who crushed us and destroyed us and hurt us and harmed us and did all this terrible stuff to us that we deserve, all of the garments that have been drugged through the pools of blood, all of that now will be burned because we don't need it anymore. It is done. See, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad the situation is, there is something better coming. Now keep in mind here that, that this is Isaiah talking to the children of Israel. This is a passage for a particular time and a specific people. But it's wonderful. I, I love this, how God uses these things, the way that God works through these words. Through the voice of his prophet, the one that he sanctified and purified with a coal from the altar, whose lips had been, had been unclean, but they were made clean, God speaks to us. Isaiah, I think he spoke better than he knew here. When he said these words, because while at one level the meaning of these words was intended for his people, his contemporaries, the situation that they found themselves in, the significance reaches forward, far beyond that situation. God has taken this very specific message for the children of Israel and has made it a message for us, too. You see, as Christians, we can't help but hear this. We can't help but hear the, the messianic intentions of these prophecies. We see Jesus in the child that was born. We see Jesus in the son that was given to us. <laughs> I don't know if Isaiah had more in mind when, the, than that just very immediate situation that confronted him. I don't know if he was envisioning something on down the road further into the future than just what had happened to the fallen kingdoms. The hope... The hope that these verses must have given those people in that time as they're marched out of the smoking rubble of their destroyed cities, the smoldering ruin of their nation, that certainly must have been something special. It must have sustained them to some degree. But it's not until Jesus, it's not until Jesus Christ embodies, incarnates, that's what the word means, this prophecy, do we really start to see the full significance of the words? Once we see Jesus, it's as if God has been telling us, you've been thinking way too small here with your little petty politics and the maneuvering of nations and empires. That's, that's small potatoes. This message is far bigger than that. So this Advent season, with these themes that we traditionally have, it's an odd season. I mean, the word is weird. 
really. It has, it's a season of, of looking forward to something that's already happened. <laughs> it's already happened. Uh, Jesus has come. Jesus has come. The child has been born. The son has been given. And we celebrate that. And we remember that. But it's kind of a little strange that we still call it Advent as if it were still in the future. It implies that something's still coming. That's what hope is about. Something coming. It's the appetite. It's the desire for something. The, the feeling that, that something might just happen. So maybe there's even another layer here of significance to these words from Isaiah. Maybe he spoke better than we know. Hmm. I believe that these words aren't just a reference to something that happened 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. I think they reach beyond that. I think this messianic prophecy, this message of hope, is still being proclaimed and still being responded to even now. This is where the story of the children of Israel helps us understand our relationship with God. Just like the Israelites, we have to hear the prophet's message in three phases. We've got to understand that too often we live as if the commands of God don't apply to us. I'm sorry. It's true. We live as if the commands of God do not apply to us. Yeah, I read that somewhere in the Bible. <laughs> but I don't really think I need to do it. You know, love my neighbor, that kind of thing. Really? Am I supposed to do that? So we need that first part of the message that tells us that something is wrong. We can't shape our lives by doing what just seems right in our own eyes. Because when we do, we will suffer the same consequence, the same exile that the children of Israel suffered. Just like Judah was overwhelmed by Assyria, even though they thought Assyria would, would, would protect them, we are overcome by the same empire, the, the empires of this world that we try to make peace with. We become the puppet of the world. We thought that we would get what we wanted, but all that's happened is that we have become enslaved. But you know, there is hope. There is hope. The yoke of that burden, that bar across our shoulders, it can be broken. For many, it has been broken. There are folks in this world, exiles, who suffer, who are in captivity to this fallen world. Each of us was there at one time. All believers know this to be true. And every human creature needs to hear, needs to hear this prophetic message that there is hope, that we don't have to fall into the despair of having an appetite, of hungering for something without believing that it will actually happen. We can envision what Isaiah talks about, this throne established and upheld with justice and righteousness. Hmm, there are so many who are still looking forward to a time when they might be restored. They hunger for it. They, they, they long for it to a time when they might come back into their inheritance, an inheritance that they once squandered and wasted, but that the Heavenly Father is ready to offer again. And that's the task. That's the work that we as Christians are allowed to share in to continually proclaim this message of hope, that that hunger, that that appetite could be satisfied by the only thing that will truly satisfy that pain can be lifted, that oppression can end, that Jesus comes to save. And that is a powerful, life-giving hope. In this season, we, while we have so much to look back on and be grateful for, the way that Jesus powerfully fulfilled this messianic prophecy that Isaiah first proclaimed 
I still think we need to look forward. We need to find a new place for hope. Hope, that's not a remembered thing, okay? We don't have it if it's been fulfilled because now we know. We hope for something that's coming still. Hope is not something we reflect on but no longer need. Hope, like Paul says, remains. It continues. It's an eternal virtue because there's always something that we can look forward to. The profound reality is that there are many who still need these words, who still look at these words from the prophet, and they need someone to fan that ember, that tiny spark of hope, into something more like a flame, into a fire. We might need that ourselves once in a while. We might start to lose hope at times because, you know, we're still in this world and we still flirt with the empires of this world. We still look at the Assyrians and say, hey, maybe it would be worth it if I got in line with them. Maybe they'll protect me and make things right. And this kingdom that God has inaugurated, what God has started with Jesus Christ, it is still becoming. It is still becoming everything that God intends it to be. The authority of the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace, it is increasing all the time, and it will continue to increase. It will continue to be perfected. It will grow until all things are under Christ's authority. All things. And there is endless peace until that holy kingdom is truly eternal. Now our hope is that God will continue. (laughs) That's a hope. I think we can believe it. A hope that God will continue to work towards this perfect restoration. That is what we hope for. That is the future that we long for. That is what our appetite, our desire is We hunger for that complete fulfillment. And you know what? I think we have good reason to believe that it will happen. My proof is the last verse that we read. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And what God wants happens. Let's pray. Gracious God, we recognize just a glimpse of the glory that you have in store for us. But even that glimpse is so awesome, so wonderful, that it inflames our hope. We long for this thing. We hope for this realization of your kingdom and we know that we're not there yet and we are still tempted at times to follow the patterns of the world to turn our back on you and do what is right in our own eyes that is an ever-present danger one that we ask your forgiveness of when we submit to it lord this is a wonderful time of year to reflect to remember the fulfillment of this prophecy in Jesus Christ, your son. But it is also a good time of year for us to look forward to all the good things that you have in store. Lord, I pray that you would help us do what we need to do to be a part of that, to be obedient, to be faithful, to keep our part of the covenant that you made with us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. We are going to share in communion today. You'll notice in your bulletins that there's a a reading, which uh, I invite you to take out and have handy. But as is our practice, we will begin with a time of reflection. We want everyone who is welcome at this table to come with hearts that are prepared. And so if you would, bow with me in a time of silence, and then we will join in these readings.
Who is invited to the Lord's table? All are invited, the young and the old, the rich and the poor, the lowest and the least. Come find your place here where there are no strangers or foreigners, only brothers and sisters in the sight of God. Why do we eat and drink at this table? We eat because on the night before Jesus died, he ate with his friends. He gave them bread and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At that same meal, he took a cup of wine and said, Drink this cup. It is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What do we remember at this table? We remember Jesus' birth and his presence as God with us. We remember Jesus' life and his love. We remember Jesus' suffering and death on the cross. We remember the resurrection and the promise of life. We remember that we are waiting in hope to see Jesus again. Join me in this prayer. God of grace, thank you for this bread and cup and for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. God of hope, Fill us with your spirit today that we might have the wisdom to understand the mystery of this table and the depth and height and breadth and length of your love for us. Through this meal, strengthen us to be followers of Jesus, a community of love in a broken world. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the eve of his death, shared a meal with his followers. There was bread there, and he took it, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he offered it to them with these words. This is my body, broken for you. Remember me whenever you eat it. We will serve the bread, ask a prayer, a blessing, and then we will take it together. Bow with me. Lord, we ask a blessing on this bread, the reminder of your son's body broken for us. We pray in his precious name. Amen. The bread, the body of Christ broken for you. Shall we take it together? After the meal, taking a cup of wine, Jesus 
gave thanks again and offered it to them with these words. This is my blood poured out for you. Remember me whenever you drink it. Again, we will serve the cup, ask you to hold it. We will say a blessing and share it together. Bow with me. Lord, we ask a blessing on this cup. Its contents remind us of Christ's blood shed willingly for us for the forgiveness of our sins. And we thank you for it. We pray in the name of the one who shed it. Amen. The cup, the blood of Christ shed for you. Let's take it together. And if you would join me in this final prayer. Jesus, you are truly Emmanuel, God with us. In this season of hope, may the meal that we have shared together nourish us to be your body in the world, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. With the angels in heaven, we join in singing your praises. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. If you would all stand with me as we close with what child is this? Let's go.
ask a blessing on your people, your precious ones. We ask that you would lead them into the world full of hope, hope that you have something better in mind than what we experience in our lives, hope for a glorious future. Lord, we pray that you would help them to share that hope with those that need it, that they would see the light shining in the darkness. Lord, until we can gather again, we pray that you'd be with us. Be with those that can't be with us today for whatever reason. Bless them. And bring us together so that we can praise and worship you again. We pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. You may go in hope.